recording. All right. Uh, welcome, everybody. This is our 21st lecture, like officially the Blackjack Lecture of the Distressed Lecture Series. And we have been going for six months now, if you can believe it. Um, it's crazy. But because we've been doing this together, we have this uh, really great new library of Distressed content. And uh, we're bringing some attention to some people who are leading in the community that may uh, maybe aren't getting the attention that they really should. Um, so it's been really great to do that. And tonight, our speaker is King Wildwin, and he has been fencing since 1974 uh, during college. Uh, he would briefly dabble in fencing, and then in the early 80s, he finally immersed himself in historical fencing uh, about a decade after that. In the Society for Creative Anachronism, he attained modest success. Uh, fencing in the Italian style, but he finally found his true niche, his real home in La Verdadera de Teresa. He has trained under Maestro Ramon Martinez at the Redwood Rapier Camp in Arcata um, between 2003 and 2008, and this gave him a foundation for historical study. Then uh, through work published by uh, Dr. Mary Dill Curtis and myself, uh, and translations by Tim Rivera, uh, he's trained with both Eric and I uh, when we visit uh, near to his home in Canada. And he's also uh, benefited from the influence of F. Braun McCash. Am I saying that right, Ken? Yes. Uh, he was recognized as the SEA Kingdom of Avacal's first Master of the Order of Defense, which is the SEA's highest acknowledgement. Uh, for contributions to the society in the prowess of sword craft, specifically the rapier side of the house. Uh, and that followed nearly two decades of service in the Order of the White Scarf. Uh, he claims to be the finest diestro in Canada, west of Montreal, and he would love to discover that there's another disciple of Carranza in that area who might be able to challenge him. Um, just a quick note about uh, when somebody is a premier order of defense, with a kingdom, I mean, this may not be clear to people that are not in the SEA, but when a kingdom does that, usually what they're trying to do is set the tone for the rest of the order. And I think Ken's being a little modest here, but when a kingdom chooses their first master of defense, uh, that carries a lot of meaning to that kingdom. It means that everybody that follows after that is sort of held to that standard. So don't let Ken play modest on that one. I think that's a big deal. Um. Okay, so what's he gonna talk about? He wants to provide an outsider's perspective. And I think outsider in this case, uh, he means uh, someone who doesn't speak Spanish. Uh, so he's studying a system in a language he can't read, uh, trying to pursue an interactive activity without consistent co-students. Um, so he's a historically oriented fencer in an organization which really isn't historically focused. It might be historically, like history adjacent sword play. <laughs> uh, but there are a lot of historical fencers. Like I think a lot of the best historical fencers are in the SCA. Not, not all of them though. And um, he's gonna talk a little bit about that experience. So uh, Ken, welcome to the lecture series. I'm really excited to hear what you have to say. And I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you to you and Eric for giving me this opportunity to talk. Um, I'm actually going to be uh, discussing some things that I've never actually addressed to people in both communities before. Uh, usually I'm interacting with um, SCA over here and uh, historical over there, and they don't talk to each other. Um, perhaps better than, than saying outsider is to say outlier. Um, extraño is uh, the territory I seem to inhabit, um, not so much by choice as by accident. Um, I could add to the biography that um, part of what makes me an outlier is I am the only uh, diestro in the entire kingdom. Um, who's uh, participating consistently. Most of the other people who have done it at one time or another have been my students. I'm also left-handed, which doesn't put me in well with uh, most of the distressa masters. So 
I, I found myself kicking uh, myself that I was preparing uh, illustrations uh, from points of view of when I really should be uh, championing diversity and just doing it left-handed and letting the rest of you guys figure it out. Um, we'll come to it a little bit more later. I would like to make a point, though, that uh, F. Braun McCash was actually the very first person who taught me anything about Verde de Destresa. I met him uh, shortly after he had shot the Highlander episode uh, Duende, and uh, he subsequently taught a few introductory classes, which whetted my appetite for all that followed. And uh, Braun has been a positive influence over the years uh, consistently. Everybody here who knows him will uh, appreciate that uh, in a community where generosity is very frequently seen at a high level, Braun stands out. Uh, he uh, just teaches so much uh, without the recompense he deserves. Now, um, one of the additional weird weirdnesses is that I didn't have any martial arts in my background before I came to fencing in the SCA. But what I did have was, as a young man, I did ice dancing. And I can recommend this, recommend this as a good way to meet girls because there's not a lot of guys who do it. And that makes for a very optimal male to female ra uh, ratio. It didn't work out that way for me, but uh, I did get some very positive things out of it. Posture, precise footwork, really strong legs. When I began fencing in college, I was able to uh, do horse dance from the very beginning, uh, long after even the teachers were standing up from uh, weariness. And that's uh, allowed me to uh, have the stamina to train more and longer over the years. It also gave me an acute sense of angular momentum. Uh, not a lot has been said about how important this is in Verdadera Destresa. If you are going to be maneuvering at closed quarters, you're going to be making a lot of very tight turns. And this is the arena of uh, angular momentum. So I've got some observations on that that I'm going to go into in a little while. I'm also a, a weird neurodiverse type who uh, can't do a thing until I understand a thing. And that means I can't watch somebody do it and then reproduce it. I actually have to know why each little bit is being done and how they connect to each other. And Verde uh, de Stresa really appealed to me because it gave me the analytical and descriptive tools uh, to, to do that more effectively. Uh, some other reasons why I have become passionate about LVD, my worn out knees don't want to lunge anymore. I still have a pretty good lunge, I can still teach a good lunge, but uh, I'd just rather stand upright and walk around the other guy. First of all, I was introduced by Kalanza's philosophy. So, Ken, uh, we're, we're getting a lot of distortion. Um, can you try speaking for me one more time? Okay. Is this, is this any better? Uh, it's, it's an audio distortion, um, not necessarily a sound level issue. Try one more time. Okay. okay. I'm getting a pop up that says uh, uh, detecting uh, background noise, but I've switched, switched off everything in the background here, here, so I don't know what that's like. I'll try bumping down my input level a bit and see if that helps. Any better? A little bit, yeah. Okay. 
as far as Carranza is concerned, um, I loved his appeal to the absolute rules uh, of physics that we can analyze uh, techniques, whether good or bad, and know exactly why they can be relied upon or should be discarded as uh, untrustworthy. And in the middle of the, the practice of violence on other human beings, I like the fact that Carranza sees the ultimate object of verdader destreza to be the improvement of the whole man. Um, as we talk about my role in the SCA, I'm going to keep touching on that because I, I really did find, uh, the more I found out about uh, Carranza, the, the more I felt like, yeah, that's the guy I want to be. If uh, the SCA had existed uh, back in his day, I'm sure he would have been the premier of the order instead of me. In that respect, so, uh, Ken, just a note to say the audio issue is completely gone. And um, I know Carranza was excommunicated, so he might not be. Uh, the <laughs> are you hearing anything from me at this point? Yeah, we are. Yeah, your audio okay. is good again. So it's only when I mention Carranza. Well, we're going to go on a Carranzian journey anyway. Uh, most of the... Uh, the time I'm going to spend tonight will be devoted to my viewpoint on Verdader de Stresa itself, but I'm going to start with uh, some of my journey in the SCA to create context. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the SCA as much as uh, I would like. There's a few people I see out there who know I could talk for far longer. But if, if anybody wants to pursue this, you can ask questions in the question period. And uh, I'm going to have communication uh, contact information on my slides. So you can get in touch with me later if you like. Just to uh, briefly summarize the SCA for anybody that doesn't know the SCA, it's an umbrella organization for the broadest diversity of historical interests. We have people who are interested in combatives, singing, dancing, cooking, uh, the research uh, of uh, agriculture. If it's still legal today, somebody is doing it in the SCA. And if it's not illegal, they're probably still researching it. Uh, that puts it in a different category than anything else out there. And I've met people in my life at SCA events. So I've got a strong interest in, in participating in the SCA and contribute, contributing to its well-being. I would describe it as a glorious festival of the past that ennobles folks. The SCA encourages uh, people to be the nobles we would like to think existed in the Middle Ages and the Renaissance. And um, there again, uh, you see uh, a good match with Hieronimo Carranza. I think he'd be in the SCA if he were alive today. Now, as far as the order of defense, I see my role as being a facilitator at that festival, that my particular area of responsibility is uh, rapier combatives, but we get the uh, whole plate. And in that respect, it's a little bit different than the Order of the White Scarf was. Uh, it's uh, the Order of Defense uh, goes throughout the SCA. The Order of the White Scarf existed as the creation of individual kingdoms uh, who recognized each other's members uniquely, 
by uh, reciprocal agreement. I should also mention that you have to be a credible fencer in historical fencing, not necessarily the hottest sword out there, but somebody who will uh, be there contributing to making sure that everybody has a good time, that safety concerns are taken care of, that um, the negotiations with the other diverse groups in the SCA take place so that everybody gets a piece of the pie. Uh, it's really multidisciplinary. But uh, I like host at the party uh, as a working definition. I like to think uh, of the titles and the badges as being a, a name tag that says, hi, I do rapier. If you want to do rapier, ask me, I'll help you get started. And over the years, I've helped a lot of people get started. It's uh, despite uh, Puck's very kind words, it would be a mistake to think that the order of defense is powerful in anything except influence. Uh, we, ha we have power only to the degree other people want to give it to us. I'll settle for uh, having the respect of the uh, people that I'm responsible for taking care of. So Ken, I have a question about that. Uh, sure. You talked about um, making yourself available to people that want to learn fencing. And one of the reasons I thought you were going to be a very interesting speaker for us. We're, we're in the process of building a global Destreza community. I mean, these lectures are sort of part of that process. Um, but you have more experience with community building than uh, we as this young Destreza community do. Do you have any insight into that? It's a different kind of community. When I started in the SCA and became a white scarf, the, the job I was doing was um, in large measure rebuilding uh, a community that wasn't successfully connecting with the larger SCA. And that sometimes meant uh, butting heads with locals who had built uh, their own little fiefdoms and were cultivating rules for SCA events that were different from what the SCA said they should be. And at the same time I was doing that, I was also butting heads with my kingdom superiors uh, who were saying, well, just make them line up with us. And I thought it was important to preserve the individual identity of the local community. And indeed, uh, I'm proud of, of having uh, managed to create a, a local environment where diversity is, well, welcome on my part, welcome on, a, on the part of a lot of others uh, that uh, I've seen uh, grow into the community. And at least tolerated by the people who remember back when the uh, rapier community in Avocal uh, were labeled swishy pokies and wire weenies. They were not well regarded by uh, the mainstream of the local SCA. And for me, uh, a great deal of that community building was rebuilding the connections of rapier folks to the rest of the SCA. I suspect probably that raising that profile for a Karansin sort of rapier fighter uh, had a great deal to do with my uh, receiving the recognition of the order of defense. And that's going back decades now. Uh, I'm very proud to say that 
there's a whole new generation out there that don't know those bad old days. And they're never going to know to what degree I contributed to that. Um, that's okay. That they don't know means I did my job. Now, how applicable is that to building a, a world community of Verdadera de Stresa? I think that there are parallels insofar as we can see cliques and people who have their own ways of doing things that are perfectly reasonable, perfectly credible in terms of the arguments to be made for their choices, but don't mesh well with equally reasonable and credible uh, choices made by others. Uh, I think that there's a role there for the diplomats uh, who will uh, move between those groups and break down some of the barriers. Ken? Yes. One of the things that, that we've been working on here with the, the lecture series is trying to bring together different groups uh, who are practicing distresa. Uh, and, you know, some of us are used to each other in some parts of online, but there's some others that are are more in, in their own little community. So we're trying to bring people into a larger, community, a more global community. How, how do you see the, the SCA distress a community that you worked with? Um, is it more isolated or are they reaching out to other people, even other areas, but still within the SCA? Can you maybe talk about that a little bit? I'm going to disappoint you by saying that the people who remain active in my corner of the SCA don't tend to be the ones that I teach LVD to. Um, they tend to be the outliers like me. And uh, yeah, Ash is waving. Um, he can become uh, one of my protégés anytime he wants but he's got to show up in the SCA some more. Um, the LVD interests in my corner of the SCA in the kingdom of Avacal uh, tend to play the game on the terms of the people who are doing Italianate fen fencing. Uh, with the exception uh, of Vancouver, uh, and a few months before that, a couple of sessions with Ash, I have not fenced with anybody who was also doing S LVD uh, for probably two or three years. So uh, the, the applied stuff I want to mention tonight is mostly about what does an uh, diestro do when all he meets is Italians? It's something of a novelty when I get to uh, face actually defends his center line vigorously. I've almost forgotten what to do with those people. LVD uh, in Avacal is the weird way of doing things. I, I give it a prominence as the premier of the order here. So I, I wouldn't go so far as to, to say that it, it's uh, ghettoized, but it, it's also something that people look at askance at. Um, it's intimidating when I, uh, as uh, Don Rodrigo, uh, tell them, you're having a problem here, and the reason is, and then develop a, a Verdadera de Stresa argument. It's not necessarily uh, terribly productive until they can see they've got a problem and they discover if they come to me, I'll help them solve it. Uh, I'll tell them why the system says it is a problem and then we'll work out together an exercise uh, to iron that out. But well, 
um, a lot of the time, what I'm doing is helping them become better Italian fencers. Um, <laughs> yeah, bring out your dead. There was a, a, a time when uh, I was the hot young sword and uh, I could pretty much count uh, on giving anybody in the kingdom uh, a run for their money. I, I could usually beat most of them most of the time. I'm getting old and slow. Um, this last six months has been on me. I don't know that I'm ever going to go back uh, to proving Verdadera Distresa works because I win tournaments. But uh, I'll send out people like Ash to do my butt kicking for me. How's that? That sounds good. I like Destreza, the art of butt kicking, also philosophy. <laughs> well, it's a lot easier to convince somebody they need to reevaluate what they're doing when they're lying on the ground looking up at you. And it's uh, considered a traditional courtesy in the SCA that at that point you extend your hand towards them and help them back onto their feet. To wind up what I have to say about the SCA, I would like to just make a point that um, it's an error to presume equivalence between a member of the Order of Defense who is called a master by rank and conflate it with a, a professional fencing master. It just gets us uh, in trouble coming and going. On the one side, people uh, overestimate our ability. And on the other side, people outside the SCA are, are saying, what is this guy talking about? He's not a real master. So please understand in all of this, the, the rank of master in the SCA is its own thing. I could talk more about that, but I'd rather talk more about LVD. Just leave that one alone. Any further questions you'd like to address to the SCA? So I have this sort of Phyllis, I know you want to set that thing about master aside, but um, it's a funny sort of thing because in the SCA, um, you outrank me. <laughs> <laughs> mundane self outranks my SCA self in a sort of in a sort of way. But um the thing about masters um is the more that I spend looking at that role, the more that I see that an organization probably should have the autonomy to decide what that means to them. So the classical Italian tradition that Eric and I studied under, we had a very clear set of guidelines um for what that meant. Um, I know that there are different historical martial arts schools in the world that are working on this. Alberto's tested some masters also. So why shouldn't the SCA be allowed to decide for themselves what that means um, without us like stepping in and, and sort of qualifying it? Do, do we have to do that? Is it healthy to do that? I, I understand there's a difference, but um, I don't know. What do you think? I think it's okay as long as people understand that uh, the SCA is its own thing. And that, uh, for me, my philosophical uh, problem with being called a master is that's a, a step down. As a member in the Order of the White Scarf, I was already en entitled Don Rodrigo. And a master is, uh, historically speaking, uh, a middle-class tradesman who belongs to a guild. And Verdadera Destresa is distinctive that in the historical period of the rapier, where the pe people elsewhere were writing uh, treatises uh, as much as advertisements, read my book, see how good it is, and then come take lessons from me in my cell because I'm a selling this service. 
And then in Spain, you get people of very uh, superior rank going all the way uh, up to Viceroy, who were the ones writing about Verdadera de Estresa. And you almost couldn't even get qualified as a fencing master unless you were entitled uh, to put a Don in front of your name. So uh, I style myself in the SCA, Don Rodrigo Sanchez de la Brijuela, uh, Maestro de la Orden de Defensa. I'm a master of the order rather than a master of defense. And if people uh, get confused about that, I'm not going to jump on them for it, but I'm also a historical reenactor, and I like getting it as close to uh, period practice as I can. So there's going to be a lot of ways uh, to approach that question. That's my way. Fair enough. Sorry to derail. Please continue. Okay. Uh, as I've mentioned, I think that there is room for erasing some of the barriers that exist between the, the martial world and the SCA in particular. Uh, I straddle uh, both of them. I've got my feet firmly in both camps. And uh, everybody here as a practitioner of Verdadera de Stresa should understand pick up you're not stable anymore unless you're in motion. So if I'm standing in both camps, I'm stable. And I think there should be more people standing in both camps. Uh, I encourage uh, anyone who's looking to me for instruction on historical swordsmanship to go take some lessons from uh, some of the people in the martial arts world who know considerably more than me. Uh, at times I did take students with me to uh, Arcata and some of them bit and some of them didn't. That's okay. They at least got exposed to a different way of seeing things. There are some very profound differences in approach that I see as not being uh, particularly defensible as the one true way. Uh, an obvious one is scoring bouts. On the one hand, the martial arts community is pretty much uh, followed what the sport uh, of modern fencing did and counts points. It's got a little more complicated than the FIE where they play a game of tag with uh, electric touch switches on the ends of their swords, but it's still essentially a, a point counting game. And because they have a rigid structure for assigning those points, it's a game, and that means that people can game the system. Instead of martial uh, techniques, they will pursue techniques that get them the points and win the, the bout and win the tournament. And we see the same thing true in the SCA, where blows are scored by play acting a wound. Struck on a limb, people stop using the limb for the duration of the bout. Struck on head, neck, or, or torso, uh, you treat it as a fight stopper. Now, as somebody who is an enthusiast of the SCA, I'm perfectly willing to uh, get into a long discussion with other people in the SCA about the shortcomings of that system. But I would also like to uh, point out to 
my friends in the martial arts side that it's a system that allows for greater latitude than does the points keeping. That yes, there are people who game the system and in an environment where s social credibility I is currency, there are natural mechanisms for keeping that I in check. And that the SEA can rise above the rules where there is a minimum criteria that you have to meet for your own blow calling. Uh, I should mention there are no judges in the SCA. Acknowledge the hits on yourself. And that means that everybody watching your bout is scrutinizing your character as much as they are your combative technique. If you get it wrong, you are going to spend uh, heavily in, in any credibility that you have gained up to that point. We're forgiving of errors, but not forgiving uh, of people who abuse the system. And one of the roles that the masters and the white scarves have is we're the ones standing at the sideline who can say from a deeper pool of experience, hey, my friend, you need to rethink what you just did there. Now, I mentioned minimum criteria. There are no maximum criteria. In that process of negotiating whether a blow is going to be counted as good, I acknowledge the hit on me and the person who wielded the sword is responsible for saying either yes or no as to the quality of the hit. So it's routinely the case that somebody will say, I've been hit, and the other will say, no, don't take that. I hit you with the flat of my blade, not the edge. And it is even possible to say, yes, within the exact wording of the rules, that counts, but that was not martially effective. Don't take that. Let's keep going and come to a really good, clean conclusion that reflects how swords should be used. And in that respect, the SCA uh, produces more fight memorable fight experienced uh, outside of the SCA, where you don't care whether you win or lose. The experience is positive because of the quality of the interaction that took place between the two of you. And in, in those moments, you don't even notice anything else that's happening. It's just the two of you standing there in a world you've created between you. And I think the SCA might benefit from rethinking how some of the point counters do things, but I think the point counters could benefit from seeing uh, the merits in that system as well. Moving on. I also see a, a very different approach to safety. We are all wielding, uh, hopefully blunt swords, but they're still swords. You get exuberant and you can seriously injure people. Potentially you can even kill them. And there are some martial arts groups that I don't want anything to do with because I don't like the, their approach to safety. There are other martial arts groups that I like their approach to safety even more than I do what takes place in the SCA. They get how serious the risks are and they don't let people start wailing on each other until the training is there to recognize where the limits are. 
Um, in the SCA, very different approach. It's a festival. It's a costume party. And one of the games at the party is a combative competition called Rapier. In that context, we want people to enjoy the party. And in order to get them involved, get them excited about what they might enjoy if they take it more seriously, uh, they're going to flail around. They're going to be minimally, and I emphasize minimally, acceptable as far as safety concerns. And that's okay because the rules recognize that these people aren't ready to play without training wheels. So for instance, uh, in the SEA, you are not allowed to do a disarm. It is just prohibited because of the risk that you'll crank it out of somebody's hand and break fingers. Now, as somebody who practices verdadera distresa, having the, the paramount technique of the system flat out prohibited is hard for me. I really want to do conclusions a lot and the SCA won't let me do it. But I'm okay with the SCA making that choice because it gets people in the door, it gets them excited about doing rapier. And if they never go any further than just participating in the game at the costume party, that's okay because the more bodies there are on the field, the more we can do, the more uh, possible it is to, uh, add more historically oriented events. So I, I, I grit my teeth and say, all right, no conclusions. In a little while, I'm gonna come back to the issue of, of conclusions and explain what I do as an alternative. What's coming out of this is the idea that you've got different concerns, you've got safety, You've got the rules that define it as a game everybody can agree to play. You've got the issue of authenticity. The SCA likes to think that it, it um, does authenticity and the best of the SCA do it very well. I'm sort of middle of the road. Um, and there are people who just show up for the party and they, hate, they help pay the rental on the hall. So they're okay too. There's different approaches to that though, where you make different choices. A martial arts group will emphasize, uh, will loosen the, the suspenders a little bit on safety and only allow people to enter that have a good track record with safety. Great. Uh, they'll have different competition formats. Well, everybody's got their own and that's okay. And authenticity, well, I don't think that you really can achieve uh, good authenticity when you're counting points, but um, perhaps in the future we can use a computer moderated uh, assignment of points and that problem will go away. Um, anybody who's read Chris Stashef will know where I got that question. Um, that three-way tug of war, there are no right answers, but there is a, a, if we make a triangle here, that area in the middle, it's all the same. You, you pick according to taste. And when all of these groups, uh, there's so many martial arts groups that are, are busy arguing with each other, with the SCA, when all of these groups start recognizing what each has to contribute, uh, we will create a, a larger body that can do more stuff. And I think that's a compelling argument. So I there- a question about that. Sure. So uh, my concern with the SCA right now is that the fencing is pretty heavily codified at this point. So, uh, for example, side sword is sort of in its own walled garden. Um, do you think that the SCA will begin to lose fencers to historical fighting arts? 
Do you think it's at risk? I don't think it's at risk. I think that there are enough people in at least the, the portion of the SCA I know that uh, value more than just the historical fencing. They're going to stick around. There uh, is a limit on how many of, of the SCA fences are even going to go over to cut and thrust. The, the cost of the equipment uh, puts a higher barrier up in front. Just the, the demands of wedging one more discipline into a, an SCA event uh, has been a, a real problem in getting cut and thrust prospering in Avocal. There are still only about half a dozen of us who are, are doing cut and thrust at all regularly. Uh, I love cut and thrust. I feel it's rapier with the training wheels off. I get to do something closer to a real conclusion. Uh, I get to do a martially effective cut instead of uh, going through the motions as I do most of the time under rapier rules. So. Cut and thrust opens up opportunities that will keep people in the SCA. I don't see there being a huge barrier between uh, rapier and cut and thrust locally. Maybe that's just because uh, I see it through the, the lens uh, of that idealist Karan scene. But the, the barriers locally tend to be uh, more visible in terms of just the logistics and the cost. Avocal has the problem that no two branches in the kingdom are any closer than a two hour drive apart, which is a huge distance by the standards of um, people in, in your neck of the woods who rarely think of traveling more than two hours to go to an SCA event. So we, we invest considerably more in the travel. Just going to uh, an interbranch practice is a big deal here because it's going to pull people who have to go at least two hours to get there and quite possibly six to eight hours. So we've got uh, distinctive challenges here, which don't necessarily make my experience representative of the SCA in general. Any further questions on the SCA or can I move on to what I do for conclusions? No, go ahead. Okay. Um, grappling is prohibited. Grabbing the hilt is prohibited. And there is some wiggle room amongst the kingdoms on exactly what you can do in terms of grasping the blade. Um, my kingdom tends to uh, at grasping the blade at all. Uh, we're prohibited from moving the blade after we take hold of it. So grasping the blade involves take hold of the blade, keep that hand still, and hit them. Now, can you still hear me? Yeah, it's I can. better. You got a little crazy there. <laughs> it's been six months since I've been able to hit somebody with a sword. What can I say? He had to do I a conclusion on himself. So <laughs> this is the first time you've reached the pinnacle. Conclusions on yourself. So the, the conclusion as such, you can't do. But you can do everything except lay uh, hold of the, the sword. And so what I do is... I regard this point as degree 11 on the Karansin scale. Karansin's illustration counts up to eight for the degrees of strength of the blade. This has a greater degree of strength than any part of the blade. So I can put my hand, this part right here, on the blade and press with it and know I have superior degrees. So, um, one of the fellows from Spain uh, corrected me one time when I, I talked about doing an atajo with my open hand. 
but it's executed as though the hand were a steel blade. And in the time it takes for an opponent to free his blade from that ataho, I have sufficient time to execute an attack with my blade that will end the bout. It's not a perfect solution, but it's reasonably successful. There are times where I'll put my hand underneath the strong of the blade and make an atajo with my sword on the weak of their blade and lever it so far out of the way that when I place my palm on top of uh, the strong, it is really out of the way. One time uh, an opponent actually dropped their sword, they were so surprised, and out of courtesy, I caught it for him. But I didn't actually disarm him, he disarmed himself. The biggest thing that I get out of uh, practicing uh, conclusions is the footwork is the same as I will do for any work with an offhand weapon or uh, parrying utensil. As soon as you are accustomed to moving in with an empty hand and going to work on their sword, it's really a very straightforward uh, business to take a dagger, do the same move, and go straight to their wrist. And if you get there and they're still standing in range, just move that point on into their face. Um, just as a practical matter, I usually start with the wrist and then move to their face. You can do exactly the same thing with a buckler, with a staff, uh, with a cloak. And all of these things will come readily uh, into the repertoire of the diestro because of practicing the conclusions. So uh, I, I teach the conclusions in the SCA just to the point where the hand closes on the weapon, because then we start to get into breaking the rules. And sometimes in um, an arts and sciences context, I, I will say, and this is what it looks like when the true master is doing it. It, uh, it provides some fun, but it doesn't play a huge role in the SCA. I'm working on changing that. I did actually manage to get the uh, rules uh, of Avakel's parent kingdom changed to permit pets with the point, which made uh, my SCA cutting days a lot simpler. I, I cut with the point very freely and since my target is usually to the head and uh, jaw as uh, Pacheco wants, uh, I don't have too much problem uh, with hitting the, the, the tender bits. But I've had a few people who have thrown their hands in the way of, of cuts and found that that was a bad idea. Now I mentioned that could you, uh, could you um, describe a little bit better what you mean by a cut with a point? Is it like a, a tip cut, like the last couple inches, or is it a, a cut in to place the tip and then you thrust from there, or, or what do you mean exactly? I brought my short sword with me. In the SCA, typically what they want for a cut is to lay the edge down and then draw it a minimum length or push cut. The, the tip cut is simply strike with the edge at the point. If you do that with a real sword, uh, you'll lay them open like a razor blade. Dropping the, the uh, problematic uh, artificial draw length from what is essentially a thrust that breaks the surface with the edge um, 
really makes my job easier as a diestro. Well, thanks. So, yeah, okay, thanks. Okay. Moving on to the, the, the question of um, angular momentum. I think that uh, anybody who does a lot of martial arts will already know this, but people who don't come from a martial arts background really don't appreciate how the weapon is propelled by the body. And if you are accustomed to rotating your body, I, I listened to Kate's lecture and I got some um, audiovisual aids here. Here's a body in a, a right angle posture. If you think of pivoting a circular step around the lead foot by moving the foot around like that, it's going to leave the rest of, of your mass behind. That's a very weak thing to do. On the other hand, if you tension the muscles in your torso so that this stack of head, shoulders, hips rotates around the hip that's over the foot, everything moves together. You get tremendous torque out of that when you need it. And moving the foot first, getting the foot in front of the mass and then trying to drag this mass along behind it. So when we do circular steps, the object is to rotate the entire body. You do a circular step, one foot around the other, the object is to do that rotation so that you're going to place the offhand to the fore for a or for an attack with the uh, offhand weapon. So you're going to need that hand out there. And this rotation of a cylinder of mass is the most effective way to do that. Until you've got the hand out in front and you're rotating, move the hand first. The hand leads the shoulder, which leads the hip, and then the foot comes last. Doing it that way uh, creates tremendous torque. You can uh, verify that experimentally. If you stand squared up in front of a partner, you put your hand on the shoulder and hold the shoulder. If you just try pulling their, their shoulder with your hand and then stepping, you, f you discover you're doing all the work with your arm. If you put your hand on their shoulder and then do a circular step so the foot underneath your hand moves behind the other foot, you're moving the entire mass of your body and that will pull the other person right along with you. Your arm becomes a leash. Applying that to Verdader de Stresa, I will use the rotation of my body to apply subjugation to the blade. Rather than doing the Pacheco Natajo, another aid, I've got a little sword here. Pacheco Natajo, you lift the point, you move the point offline, you bring the blade down. If you've moved the point upwards, to create an atajo and you're rotating the entire body, you don't have to move your hand. It's much subtler than moving the hand. There's no feedback the other uh, person gains until you have the atajo. And when you get there, you've got your entire body behind it. You can uh, apply considerable force on their blade without them even noticing that the, the force is coming from the step rather than from the pressure of your hand. Perhaps some of the people who can actually read the treatises uh, will chime in on this. 
I've never seen any discussion of rotating the, the, the cylinder that way uh, discussed in Verdadera de Stresa, but it fits solidly in the physical model that is being used. And um, I found success with it. I have found success teaching other people to use this as well. It's also something when you get accustomed to doing um, a circular step. Um, forward foot to the back. It works in quite well with a conclusion. If you're being attacked on your outside line, I'm going to be left handed here. Outside line, you can do the Itaho, but if as you went Third foot circles around behind, you're going to get the same kind of advantage that uh, the Italianate get out of stepping away from an attack by stretching the distance the attack is traveling. You are stretching the time it takes for the hit to occur. And that extra time uh, allows you to better control their blade before it reaches you. Because the side that it, they're attacking is simply isn't there anymore. In the... Uh, Ken, I have a question from somebody in the audience. Um, mm -hmm. This this technique that you're talking about, do you have drills um, that you've put together that help would help somebody put it, uh, get this sort of realized? This particular one, um, yes. The, the idea of using the rotations, it usually involves putting the swords down and actually working on, on uh, pressing against a partner's shoulders so that they uh, can learn how much force they're exerting when they do it right and when they're doing it wrong and they can see the difference. And um, I should borrow another page from Kate and say, not right and wrong, doing it more effectively and doing it in a manner where there's room for improvement. The drill, though, involves an action that creates proprioceptive feedback. People have to feel the difference. For the, the conclusion, the drill is pretty much uh, like you would set up any other attack on the outside line. Receive the attack by making the Itaho to the outside. I'm wandering off the camera here. And as you are doing that, stepping back. Oh, this is particularly effective if, the, if they get in close to you because you're going to the attacker and me. I'm engaging with the Atajo, and as the attack comes towards me, I pivot back my sword foot and fade back away. Now my sword is still on the weak of their blade. I've got excellent uh, control of their blade, and I'm in the stance I want to be in for doing a conclusion, which means I get to do a, con a conclusion on somebody who thought he was going to zap me with a, with a lunge. Have you ever taught conclusion as a defense against lunge? There's a question for you. Uh, me? Yeah. Oh yeah, all the time. Plenty. Well, that's why you guys are masters and I'm just a master in the order. <laughs> Now, one big uh, difference I see between uh, what I was learning from uh, Maestro Martinez and what I see generally coming out of people who are resorting to the books is people in the books are looking at the common circle and the lines of infinity, the diameter, of course, and transversals drawn inside the common circle. I really think that people should be looking more at the 
uh, maximum circle. And if you'll turn on here, I want to show you a slide. Are people seeing that? Yes. Yes. Okay. Now, if I can get the slideshow started. It is not cooperating with me, so we'll go to plan B. In blue, you'll see the, the typical diagram where the diestro starts here and the contrario is on the opposite side of the common circle. I've deliberately muted that to draw attention to the maximum circle, which is the re reach of the contrario's weapon. If I step inside that circle, the opponent can attack me without any further step. That's a much more dangerous place to be than standing on the outside of that circle. So I want to do my maneuvering on the edge of that circle. Now, yes, I am reinventing the Rada here. And in that respect, I, I'm not staying true to the Pachekin theory that I've, I've learned from the Curtises. But it's implicit even in, with Pacheco. So let's see where that one goes. I'll turn off. That image for a few minutes. Okay, the object is to create inequality. If I'm on the diameter, the other guy has just as good a chance of hitting me as I have of hitting him. As soon as I step off the diameter, he has to work much harder to hit me. That's one of the sovereign rules of Verdadera de Stresa. If I am not going around the outside of that circle, I am not exploiting that inequality as far as I have the opportunity to. At the moment where I'm trying to enter that circle, I don't want to be on the diameter. If I'm fighting an Italian, I'm gonna talk a lot about of Italians since that's mostly what I fight. The Italian's not gonna give me an opportunity to put an atajo on his blade. If he's waiting for me to attack him, he's not gonna give me an opportunity to collect his blade with a general. So the tool I have to use for opening the door to this defense is footwork. And I need to get to a moment in time where I'm not standing on the diameter, I'm standing on his maximum circle. And from that place, now I can enter his defensive space on my terms. When I'm off the diameter, I know which side his me. I don't have to defend both sides. His sword, me. Just by virtue of walking around that circle, I can put my sword over top of his blade without really trying. He's got to deal with this Atajo before I even uh, engage. And the secret of using that circle is you don't just walk around the circle. The drills that uh, you see in the Martinez videos, those are exercises to train people off of the strip into stopping 
their retreat backwards and instead retreating sideways. It took me a while to figure that one out. And when I did, my verdadera destreza game got much better. So, one of the reasons that I liked uh, LVD when I discovered it is as a, a junkyard dog uh, Italian fencer, my motto was run away from the threatening weapon, not from the target. LVD gave me the theoretical basis for saying that. It also lets me develop a, an opening game to the chess match. If you're standing right in front of an Italian, the opening game consists entirely of how do I manage to plow his point aside on the way to hitting him? Uh, can the Italian be a wise vulgar? I don't think he can be while he's trying to plow aside the blade instead of encouraging the other guy to take his blade offline. And in that moment where I'm going around the circle, job done. Now, I tied in the circle with the concept of generalship. And discovered that the, the very popular OODA loop, uh, which is a great way to analyze um, adversarial transactions. The OODA loop was invented by John Boyd, who used to be a fighter pilot. He had a standing bet with the pilots of the US Air Force Tactical School that starting from a position of disadvantage, uh, he could beat them in a, in a combat of maneuver in 40 seconds, and he never lost the bet. And his secret was he varied speed and direction constantly. He created so many changes of speed and direction that the opponent could not keep up with the changes and eventually failed to react correctly to what was taking place. We can do that with our footwork as diestros. So before I enter that circle, I'm going to make a variety of, uh, of maneuvering steps that will keep me near that margin, in and out just a little bit to keep him convinced I'm on the brink of actually entering and then not going in until he miscalculates. And the miscalculation I'm looking for is going to be using footwork. And here's where I'm gonna go back to the slides. Pretty typical per shaken diagram. Here's an Italian doing this uh, using the same notation. I've moved it from the Spanish foot position, right foot forward, and the black dot indicates the weight. Spaniard weight in the center, Italian with the weight back. That's your standard gigante stance. And here's the weight moved forward. Mr. Giganti is ready to do a lunge. Here's the range of motion. If I am circling the Italian clockwise, I'm moving into the, trying to capture the degrees of the profile. The green footprint represents the Italian's lead foot here as he changes his step, his, makes a step to change his stance and he's following me. And there's the, from the black starting position after he's moved the rear foot. He can try moving uh, his rear foot first, but looks what's happening if he's still got his lead foot there and he moves his rear foot here. He's turning his base so flat, he's no longer stable. 
that's a small advantage for the diestro right off the bat. Now, if I as a diestro circle counterclockwise, he's going to move his right foot first and then his left foot. And if he reverses those, it looks even better for uh, diestro circling because we get this foot moved here and this foot still here. And if he tries to move his right foot to the left, then he's going to be totally squared up with his feet side by side. And I think we've got a good chance of managing to outmaneuver him. I think I'm going to break off this slide sequence. And just talk from my notes. So when you combine those two things, what the diestro is looking for as an opening is the diestro does not want the Italian to be able to lunge at the precise moment he's moving into range of, of the Italian. The condition where he knows the Italian can't lunge is the Italian has just moved his lead foot. As that foot hits the ground and he puts his weight on it to move his rear foot, uh, he can back away. He can move to turn in one direction, but not effectively in the other. And this is a really good time for the diestro to launch and advance into the circle that will take him to a mean of proportion. Now, that's not to say that this is a guaranteed solution, but it gives you the conditions where you know he can't attack you and if you shove a sword point in his face, he will be thinking far less about the lunge he might have done, and you can move on to another attack. How are we doing on time? How much time have we got left? Uh, we have about 10 minutes left in the lecture proper, plus some overflow time. We can use it okay. if we want it. Then I'll say a few more things uh, about what to do with the other guy's blade. When I have tried using the, the stance of Be Bella Española, it doesn't work for me. I find it, it's far more useful to stay upright and do that seemingly random uh, maneuver of changing uh, speed and vector and picking my moment to step across the, the circle. When I come to what to do with his blade, there, there's really two kinds of Italians and the, the more typical one is using Iron Gate. Their point's high, the hilt's low, and the point is just close enough that we can get some overlap between the blades if we're not overly concerned with them being a blazingly fast lunge. So here's typically what it looks like. In this position, the diestro sword point is actually closer to the Italian than the Italian sword point is to the diestro. And you've got more reaction time. All it takes is a little touch at the points of the blade to get some feedback through the steel. Tacto will tell you what he wants to do next. And the and then you can respond. If you lose blade contact, well, he's going underneath. It's the only sensible thing to do. And our answer to that is 
either step away and cross the blade or redirect and step to the side that he thought was going to be free. That'll get you really good blade contact and then you can make a firm atajo. This is an offensive move. You've got to have confidence you can actually get the blade contact. If they are twitchy and won't let you touch your blade, I've got a reputation for having a good sense of tacto. When blades cross, I react better than the other guy. People don't let me get that anymore. So instead, I put my blade down, this one on your right, and if they try to extend, we still have a crossing. It's not a Taho, but it's good enough to work with. Another scary thing for the Italian is he thinks he's going to lunge. I've got enough engagement here. If I can step around my blade, I can, I can do a conclusion straight into his lunge. I like that. That's worked for me. None of this works though, when you get the Italian who on the ground and refused contact entirely. That guy, if he's a scary fast lunger, you're not going to be able to do anything with him until he's lunging. So the secret with that fellow is just don't be there. Do not spend any time on the diameter. But if you're worried that you're close enough, he might lunge as you're moving off the diameter. I'm presenting the Diestro sword. And here's the guy that's going to lunge down here. You can either point your sword into his, the crook of, of his elbow. And as he extends, he has to lift his hand and that will throw his arm onto your sword point. So if there's a virtual atajo, I think of this one as a virtual thrust. All I have to focus on is stepping out of the way of his point. And I'm going to be doing that anyway, because I am not going to stand on the diameter when the other guy is pointing a sword at me. Once I'm off the diameter, then we're back to the inequalities. Now, I know a few people who will lay their, their sword inches off the ground and they can lunge before I can react. The solution is as soon as you have a sense that they are ready to lunge, step off the diameter, uh, preferably to your inside. Do a narrowing. Now, if they lunge, you have already closed the quadrant where they have to attack it's down on the ground. If you want to step to your outside, then do a week under and you will again close that line. You know which line they're going to attack even if you can't react to it because you've stepped off the diameter. Now, I see Ash in the audience. I uh, was showing him the last time that we actually worked together how to use this proactively. If they want to lunge and they raise the point, then your, weak, your narrowing action will pick up the sword before you have entered the space. That means you can bring it through into an atajo. And then because you are off the diameter, if you're looking at the swords from the top, it's going to end, let's see, there. So, what we get here is to follow you off the, the circle. When you pick up their blade with the general action, you're putting them in the same position 
that you wanted for a simple Atajo attack. You subject their blade and just push it into their face. I really don't like playing with the gunslingers, the people that think fencing is just whoever can hit fastest. But, but if that's what the uh, opponent wants to do, I know Verdadera de Stresa gives me tools to deal with those people. Tool is just the same as usual. Walk around them and stick your, your, your point in their face. Second, Second tool is create, create conditions where they want to hit you, and, and you know, you know where they want. want. And throw, throw your, your blade into that path to collect their blade, even before they attack. Again, again, we're, we're getting the audio issues again. Can you just adjust your mic, maybe? Sure. One moment. Did you hear Did that? You hear that? Uh, yeah, we still got the audio distortion. Any better? Any better? Not yet. Okay, okay. Well, I can hear an echo happening, so I think it's a feedback issue. Okay, okay. I think this is, this is as good as I can make it. Am I belaboring the point here, or... Am I actually on some useful stuff? I think you've been useful. Um, we're challenged a little bit by the audio issue. I thought we might be okay. Give it another go for me. Okay. Hey, we're good. Perfect. Thank you. Excellent. As a left-hander, uh, I try to make my instruction neutral. Uh, what I tell people when they come into this is the first thing you have to do is fight the blade. It does not matter which hand holds the blade. Now, there are mechanical differences in two people with same hand dominance fighting, and two people with mirror dominance. But as a beginner, if you can control their blade, there will be something behind that blade that you can hit. Just hit them there. And as you learn a little bit more, we can begin to discuss the, the mechanical refinements. Being left-handed, I do find that uh, I've had my work cut out for me. Typically, a class will teach right-handers. If I'm in a class, I learn how to do things right-handed, and then I have to figure out how to make it work as a left-hander. So right from the very start, every fencing lesson I take involves me having to uh, come to terms with what does this mean? How do the mechanics work when the hand changes? That's been an interesting journey. It's, it's doubly interesting when I can't watch somebody and know what they're doing. I'm usually the last person in the, the class that gets something. You can tell from what I've been saying about the circles that uh, there's a lot of rata in my DNA. But weirdly, my theory is all Pachekin because th that has been pretty much all that was available for a long time in the English language. So when I continue to do something that's more from the pages of rata th than uh, Narayas, I will, on the basis of my historical side, that 
I'm entitled to do that because everything that Radha tells you how to do is implicit in the rules that Pacheco lies down. Uh, and Pacheco could very well have written Radha's book if he'd watched the interaction of 17th century diestros and 17th century Italians. As the century went on, the two groups started to borrow from each other. They started to look more like each other. And uh, you have in Rada, when he explains how to do a lunge, he's got a, a LVD accent. He insists on taking it off the, the diameter and how to do that. But he introduces his lunge by saying, it really is better if you do it the way I've already told you, which is the old fashioned LVD. So I don't feel I need to uh, apologize for Rada. If Pacheco had been around a century later, Pacheco would have been writing treatises telling you why Rada was wrong and Pacheco was right. And then he would have told you how to do it exactly like uh, Rada did. There, I've got in the, the compulsory bashing Pacheco. I think um, I'm going to stop there and just throw it open to questions. No, I take that back. I, I've got one more thing I would like to say as part of the structured talk. In everything that I have taken from the Martinez instruction, I feel uh, it works for my body type and my personality. And I will use a much more Pachekan approach to teaching some other people who aren't me. One thing in particular, uh, when it comes to atajos, if people aren't doing genteel um, foil-like fencing with lighter blades, you need to use more subjection of the blade. Ramon Martinez actually teaches subjection, but uh, in his attempts to make the system accessible to those that had already trained in the modern system, he isolated subjection, and he teaches that to you after he's shown you an atajo without the subjection. Um, if you look at video of uh, Martinez himself fencing or some of the people that have graduated from his instruction, those people are subjecting. They can't get along without it. I have... Um, taken from everybody that has taught me. There are aspects of LVD that I, I learned from uh, Bron McCash over 20 years ago, and I don't do it that way anymore. Uh, I've, I've got better tools available in the light of knowing more about the analysis that LVD can apply. Uh, there's stuff that I don't do from the Martinez instruction anymore. There's stuff I uh, don't do from uh, the Curtis instruction anymore. But more likely than that, not. It's going to look more uh, Puck Curtis-like as I progress. Closing thought is uh, to quote uh, something that came from uh, Ettenhart as translated by uh, Dr. Mary Curtis. The purpose of this science is for the swordsman to secure his own defense and to execute his offense against the opponent in a way that supports his defense. And the footnote in that translation reads, to defend and strike with defense. Now, I just love the way Ettenhardt puts it. I love the way uh, Mary has translated it. And uh, I, I think that that summary really does go back to the core of all swordsmanship, regardless of system. But 
by the time I had made that my own, it came out sounding a little differently. This is mine. Number one, get that in camera. One, don't get hit. Two, while not getting hit, three, hit the opponent. By rearranging the concepts in that way, I emphasize defense, defense. Bad swordsmanship in any school usually involves not paying attention to defense. And when you've got that working for you, well, then you can get around to the offense. It's going to be easy. So my fencing is no longer uh, Martinez fencing, and it's not even Puck Curtis's fencing, no matter how much he's contributed to it. It's my fencing. As a fencer in the SCA, you can say it's Don Rodrigo's fencing. In a martial arts context, it's Ken Wildwind's fence. Whatever you access your own and internalize it, it won't be your fencing. There. Now, questions, please. All right, it is time to put your questions into the chat. Um, but I would say Carranza says that you need to tune the fencing to the fencer, both to their body and spirit, for it to be distreza. So we've had people accusing you of channeling Carranza um, in the chat as you go along. I'm okay with that. <laughs> yeah, I would be too. Oh, here we go. John Golden asks, what is the kin wild wind? Acometimiento. <laughs> You know, it's funny you should ask that question because I just happen to have some slides. Does everybody see it coming to me, Anto? Yes. Yeah, we can see it. Okay. And oddly enough, I'm not getting the slide viewing working, so we'll try it this way. This is the short form. Acometimiento, attack to hit, threaten to hit in order to attack. Some of the other definitions we've, we've had, and the one that I've been pursuing for going on two decades is a very instrumental functional definition, but this really boils it down to something that somebody can recite to themselves uh, while it's with the sword. Now, having done that, I've also got a functional definition. I've got part of the text here hidden by the uh, windows. Can you see? All of the text? Good. We can see all the text that we can see. <laughs> so if this frame is intact, we, we know that everything is there. Yeah. There's, this embraces pretty much all of the authoritative definitions of a comitimiento that I have encountered. And what makes this one mine is to emphasize that there, there is an object here. When Pacheco defends a Tajo, he tells you the mechanics of it, and he tells you why you're going to do it. Well, I started with the why. We want to dismantle the opponent's defense so we can hit them. And to do that, we want a series of attacks. I say avalanche because a good acometimiento is overwhelming. It hits one after the other. It will provoke a defense. And once that defense has created a defensive movement, then you've got the ability to act in propiado. To add to this, each attack has to be committed. Uh, we've had some variations of defense 
uh, of accommodimiento that imply uh, it is merely falsing. I don't find that in uh, any of the uh, texts that I've had access to by English translation. It's just bad fencing to throw something at somebody that they're going to scorn because they know it's not a real attack. So if they don't defend, hit them, follow through, make it sustained, make it unrelenting. Once the opponent is no longer busy reacting to your attacks, it's not a commentimiento anymore. And finally, make it dynamic. If your actions are not accounting for what the other person is actually doing, uh, you've wandered off into a fantasy land where the script for your accompaniento might have been marvelous, but the real world has said no. Some people like flowcharts. Here's my flowchart. This was inspired by a, a flowchart in a notebook that Puck posted a long time ago. Yeah, I scribbled that one on like the back of a napkin or something. And since you've noticed I'm as prolix as, as Pacheco, I've got well, a further takeaway here. This is me channeling for Pacheco. It sounds like an arrogant thing to say, but a commentimiento is about narrowing the other person's options. And when the, all the branches in the decision tree go your way, who cares which one they choose? They're all good. Again, you need to respond in real time to what the other person is doing. It's like jazz. You've got a goal. You're going to play towards that goal. But the exact notes along the way will depend on what the other person in the duo is playing. And last, exploit what is offered. Every single geometry is an opportunity if you're in control. Even if the other person has subjected your blade, if you understand a movement of diversion, that can turn into a conclusion. So there's Ken Wildwind's version of accometimiento. I could say that when we started, but I've got a dry math now. Next question, please. So I'm having a hard time seeing the chat here. Do we have any more questions? Uh, well, it takes them some time. They're, they're cogitating. <laughs> that means either I did a very good job or not good enough. I think um, on a Zoom meeting, people tend to lean back and then when they're suddenly like on the spot, then they have to jump forward and then they have to think of their question. Uh, so we, we usually have to give them a minute. Well, by predisposition, I'm a counter puncher. So I'm willing to let um, the contrario bring it to me. Does everyone in, in this chat know that the head man in a bullfight is called a diestro? It's the same term as is used uh, for the skilled swordsman. And there's a, a great deal of similarity uh, in the footwork. When the diestro kills a bull, uh, he steps off the diameter leaves his point in front of the bull and pushes the sword in as the bull goes by. 
I think every one of us that's pursued Veridadera Distresa for very long has done a, a counterattack like that. Got a book about bulls and bullfighting. <laughs> it's it's inevitable. If you have a, a, an interest in Verdader de Stresa, sooner or later, you're going to have to read about bullfighting. I think one of the things that's interesting about bullfighters is you would expect with a, an animal that's in excess of 500 pounds, charging at you with a pair of spikes that you might take big steps. And uh, I don't typically see big steps from bullfighters. Um, it looks like they take much smaller steps much more quickly. Well, the bull is not going to respond to rhythm the way a, a human opponent will. If you uh, consider angular distance, the farther away from your opponent you are, the bigger the step you have to make uh, to achieve the same angular displacement. So maneuvering around the outside of the circle, I'll take uh, medium-sized steps and occasionally vary it upwards to a long stride or to a short stride. Once I get into getting the job done, if I'm at a proportionado, I'll be taking very tiny steps. And then once I've hit them, just in case they've still got some fight in them, I'll take a huge step away from that place where they want to hit me. Preferably right behind them. So we have a question about, um, let's see, I'm not sure the context of this question, but um, what do they do that triggers your offline movement? Caden, can you um, give me a little more detail on that question? When you're referring uh, to they, what does that mean? Um, like, like your opponent. So um, I guess maybe when you've entered um, Medio Proporcional, for example, like would you move offline or like, I guess you would try to move offline, but like, like when, like when are you moving offline? I, I don't. I'm not sure how to phrase my question. Sorry. <laughs> I don't bother moving offline if I'm distant from the opponent. There, there's no point in it. He's in the center of the circle. Uh, he can track around a lot faster than I can move around the circle. Right. I move offline as I come up to the Medio de Proporcional. It's the moment where I am at risk of the opponent lunging. Um, in fact, the lunge is going to reach a little farther than Medio de Proporcional, so Medio de Proporcion. So I want to move off the, the diameter before I, I reach the circle, but I'm going to approach on the diameter. Once I'm off the, the uh, diameter, I want the other uh, fencer to be playing catch up. From that point forward, I want my footwork to be in a comitimiento. Whether I'm entering the circle or not, I want to constantly force the other person to react and steal the appropriado from him. Now, if I am offline and I've got that opening into the circle, I may actually step uh, what is for me directly forward. It will be parallel to the opponent's diameter. And if I pull up my first slide again, I've got an illustration of 
angulation, which shows the diastro taking one step to the D and a second step back out of the circle. He's got a proportionado there when he's on the D. And those two steps are carrying him an eighth of the way around the circle. So that's showing angular displacement. When am I moving off the, the diameter? As soon as the other guy can hit me. When do I stay off the diameter? Other guy can hit me. That makes sense? Uh, yeah, yeah. Thanks. Now I can add something that didn't come from my ice dancing because you don't stand on your toes when you're um, skating on blades. But I find that my footwork stays more nimble if I keep the weight uh, towards my toes. I don't want to plant my heel. So in this adversarial dance, uh, I want it to be uh, with the syncopated rhythm of, of flamenco and the uh, smoothness uh, of a waltz. Uh, we have a question for you um, in the chat. So um, I have to scroll up just a little bit. Speaking of bullfighting, how do you fence aggressively in La Verdadera Distresa without sacrificing defense in, in your opinion? Okay. Defense does not get sacrificed ever if you are doing good Verdadera Distresa. How do you play aggressively? Accomodimiento. And the, the dance steps that I've been talking about are an accomodimiento of space. There's going to have to be a moment in offensive action where you enter that circle and you want to do it in your terms. You can find that opening where the opponent has misstepped and it's inevitable because of the asymmetry, then you will get an opportunity to move inside the circle where you can strike uh, with a sound defense. You will be off of the diameter. You will have the opportunity to place your steel in between your tender body and the threatening sword. And you're pointing in, in their face, which means uh, they're suddenly getting preoccupied with defending themselves. That being said, never rely on the other person to act intelligently. In the, it doesn't matter how great the threat is, they can still do something stupid. There are a lot of stupid people out there who only see the opportunity to hit you and not that you're about to hit them. And that's why the history books are full of duels where both people died. Uh, once you enter the circle, it's a comitimiento. Make a, a credible threat the moment that you've got a foot across the line. Force them to respond to that threat. If they don't respond, then start thinking more defensively. If they do respond, then there's an action. There's movement. You can break in on the time of that movement. And Apropiado is your friend. As I mentioned, I'm basically a counterpuncher. I love it when they come to me. It makes it so much easier if I don't have to march across that circle. But I've also got a reputation for counterpunching successfully. So for the last few years, I've been working really hard on that aggressive game. It's a matter of use your footwork to get off of the diameter before you get into the circle 
And once you're in the circle, a comitimiento, threaten them, threaten them, threaten them. And when they miscalculate, follow that threat through and hit them. So I have a question for you. I think probably this should be the last question since we're half after the hour, um, as long as nobody else objects. But um, you, you studied with uh, Ramon Martinez somewhat. Um, what are the strengths that you took from that that you don't see in other places? So he's teaching something, uh, I would say, different from what's in the sort of standard distressive practice right now. But uh, what did you get from that that you carried forward and that you kept? Uh, a lot. He is an extraordinarily fine fencer. And his pedagogy is very thorough. What I learned from him, I learned very well. Um, the thing that I keep coming back to in my mind that's distinctly different from what's typically taught in most martial arts schools is there is a whole lot of blade on blade contact. You get comfortable with the blade on blade. You learn the tacto and tactile feedback is a lot faster than watching the other blade when you can recognize what the other blade is going to do from uh, the signals you get from the blade itself uh, you're halfway to reacting before the other person has got underway so i'm not particularly fast but many people think I'm fast because I'm reacting so early to what they're doing. And uh, I can uh, credit Ramon with having indoctrinated the tacto very thoroughly. Uh, tactically, the work with the circles, uh, I'm used to trying to get around the other sword rather than plow it out of the way. That's not to say I always do this, uh, if I'm tired and plant both my feet on the floor, uh, there have been fights uh, where uh, I look terribly vulgar in my attachment to the diameter, and I lose those fights. Uh, but when I do it the way I was taught, it's all so much easier. Those are the, the yeah. two things that are, are outstanding. Well, thank you very much for that. And um, I think that's where we should stop it tonight. Um, Ken, thank you so much for being a speaker tonight and taking the time to put this together. I know um, that like you had to get through some technical issues and I think you bought that headset just so that you could speak to us tonight. Uh, uh, so uh, I appreciate thanks. it. Thank you very much for the opportunity to do this talk. And no, I didn't actually buy any hardware. Uh, I had the headset beforehand and uh, a kind friend d delivered the camera to me. Oh, perfect. Okay. Um, next week, uh, Eric is going to lead another dialogue discussion. We have uh, a couple more speakers lined up for sure, but they needed a little more time to prepare. So uh, we'll have a hosted discussion next week. Uh, and the goal, uh, maybe Eric can talk to this a little bit, but the goal is to get into a little more depth uh, in the discussion uh, with fewer topics. And then uh, I've got a bit of a surprise for the speaker after that, um, because people have been asking about New World Destreza, and I've got somebody who may be able to speak to that a little bit. 